Hello, welcome to the Ponderings Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about Henry Bergson's creative evolution. This is the fourth and final episode of the Henry Bergson series. The Ponderings Podcast can be accessed on any podcast hosting site such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the Ponderings Podcasts are also available in video format on YouTube. The episodes are released every week on Mondays. And in this episode, I'll be talking about Henry Bergson's concept of creative evolution. This ties together his concepts of intuition, duration, and memory, and how they all intertwine and interconnect to give us the experience of enduring subjects in an ever-changing and entangled universe. Life as temporal movement informed by duration and retained in memory. So for Bergson, time and space are not abstracted from the universe. They aren't this background or ground of being, but rather existence is made up of processes, temporal processes. Um, These temporal processes are what Bergson calls the duration. So examples of duration are things that cannot be quantified or categorized abstractly. Um, These things can be emotions, the color spectrum, music, experience, the phenomenal experience of things, subjective experience. He categorizes knowledge into two different types, the quantitative versus qualitative. So quantitative has more to do with categorizing, numbering, labeling. This would be um, human intelligence or what he calls human intelligence. This ability to abstract and objectify our um, experience of ourselves as well as like other things. Um, And then qualitative uh, multiplicity has to do with, again, what I was talking about earlier, things that are similar to emotions, feeling, um, things that you can't quantify, you can't number, you can't label. So experience as it is life as it is, how we experience the process of becoming, and things like that. So what's most important for Bergson is this distinction between substance versus process. Substance would be the things that can abstract from other things, um, things seen as objects rather than processes, things seen as not interconnected or interrelated or dependent on on other things. We're seeing things around us and ourselves as independent. And Bergson says no to substance, ontology, or things of that nature. He proposes that things are more uh, made up of processes, that everything is interconnected, nothing is independent or completely independent. We have membranes, but they're not completely closed membranes. We're always in a sort of interaction or participation with the environment and with other creatures and with the universe at large. So Henry Bergson's philosophy is mostly a process philosophy. So the biggest concept for Bergson is intuition, which is the process of entering into duration. The sort of all-encompassing process that everything is a part of for Bergson is what he terms duration. It's sort of his, it's the word he uses when he's talking about time and space as a thing that is not outside of our reality, but something inherent in our reality. Like we are time and space constantly in a process, in duration. Intuition is not something that can be quantified. It is actually an experience that is of duration. It's, intuition is duration. And the ability to quantify or the um, action of quantifying is always taking you out of intuition or you're sort of looking at things outside of duration in an abstract way. Your your thoughts are sort of abstracted from the duration itself when you're thinking in a sort of quantifiable way. And memory, as I talked about in previous episodes, it's the preservation of past temporal processes that are added onto the present moment. So it's a creative advance, a continual addition to the ongoing process of duration. Um, Here is where we start to get into the concept of evolution, which is what this whole episode is going to be about. 
But again, memory is also, um, you can think of it as the way that the universe sort of keeps tabs of every real occasion that occurs in time. So we'll think of like a line. There's a line and duration is that line that continues to go on and on and on. And there's always that line. We can't see the end of it. We're sort of living that line or living in that duration. And every past Everything that is behind us is kept within us and every other creature in the form of memory. And we're sort of continuously building on top of that. So that's why Henry Brookson sort of calls it a creative evolution. There's new um, things always occurring that is building on top of this duration, this um, evolution evolutionary existence so creative evolution is a combination of habitual the habitual way of knowing things analytical form of knowledge and the intuitive way of entering into duration so again habitual human intelligence is can be likened to repetition it has to do with the things that are afforded to us the things that we interact with that are necessary for us in the environment. We act in way to fulfill needs in order to find food. Um, specifically, human intelligence has to do with the ability to create tools, to um, have a strategy on how to like survive in the environment or how to navigate the environment. We're situated in a duration. And as a result of being situated, we sort of categorize and label to sort of make sense of things, to select what's the best possible scenario or option to sort of move along. Um, And intuition is, again, that entering into duration, it has to do with difference and novelty. Instead of living in that sort of habitual human intelligence where things are sort of a routine, you're sort of predicting things and trying to make sense of your environment when you're in when you're in a um, intuitive mode you allow for difference this form of knowledge is refraining from categorizing or abstracting it's sort of like a flow state you're just being part of the duration it allows you to step back from regular routine or habitual action it's sort of a form of hesitation but not hesitation in the form of analysis but sort of hesitation from an unconscious habitual way of being this this kind of hesitation allows for novelty and difference to occur and this creative evolution is bergson's main metaphysical scheme it accounts for both continuity which is the duration itself processes and discontinuity the habitual intelligence analytic cognition you know our ability to select from different options or ability to abstract things from their relations to other things. So in his creative evolution, Burson has four main steps to explain how, um, how it accounts for both of these senses of life, the continuity and the discontinuity. Um, I'm going to lay out the four steps and then I'll go through each one individually and explain them more in depth. So the first step is the vital impulse. He believes that there must be an original common impulse for creation in all the living species or creatures. Um, The second step is the tendency theory. He proposes that the original impulse must have a tendency for divergence and differentiation in order to explain evolution. And then the third step is there are two main diverging tendencies, which are instinct and the structure of intelligence. For Bergson, humans are the only living creatures that operate mainly on intelligence. This is the capacity for humans to have a practical and spatialized approach to the world, sort of looking at things through an analytic and external lens. Humans are the only species that want to know life but cannot do so. They are the ones that are sort of have an inquiry on their own existence. And then the fourth step is the effort of intuition. This is what allows humans to be able to enter into the original creative impulse. All right, so now going in depth, the first step, the vital impulse. So why vital impulse? So Bergson answers this question by first refuting finalism and mechanism. Finalism is the belief in final causes or teleology. So teleology is the explanation of phenomena 
in terms of the purpose they serve rather than of the cause of which they arise. The original vital impulse serves as the cause of which things arise rather than a telos that is situated at the end, like finalism. So instead of focusing on the end, the purpose of things, the vital impulse is sort of focusing on how things originate. Bergson's metaphysical scheme starts off by not the purpose or the, you know, the because of things, but it's just how things even originate in the first place, that movement, that duration. And then mechanism in philosophy is the belief that natural wholes, living things, are like complicated machines that are composed of parts that lack any intrinsic relationship to each other. Bergson states that if this is so, then there would be no novelty or change in the world. Bergson argues that the vital impulse is among all existing processes in the universe and that all these processes are interconnected and interrelated through this vital impulse. So instead of being machines that are independent and not connected to others, this interconnection allows for new relationships to be always forming and it allows for evolution to even happen. Because if it was just machines interacting in independent ways, it, that would only allow for the same things to be occurring, the same habitual things to be occurring. But if things, if processes are interconnected from the get-go, and they're always interconnected, there's always new relationships that are forming, because it's necessary for new relationships to be forming. So the second step is the tendency theory that Bergson creates. So how did the phenomenon of evolution occur from the simple original vital impulse into different species, individuals, and organs? So again, this vital impulse is not an end, it's in, it comes as a beginning, it's an originating force. But how did this impulse create other things or provide the grounds for, you know, evolution, creative evolution? So bifurcations, divisions, and differentiations occur as a result of Bergson's two opposite tendencies. And these two opposite, opposite tendencies are instinct and intelligence. Instinct is, for example, the animal's ability to be mobile, whereas plants are immobile. Animals need to be mobile in order to find food. Plants survive and grow through photosynthesis, which does not require movement. The instinct is a sort of it doesn't require planning it's something built into the creature itself and then for humans however we're not adequately equipped to survive by instinct alone we need our intelligence to build tools create strategies plans etc our intelligence helps us sort of work with our bodies in a way that allows us to manipulate our environment rather than through instinct where we're just we're not manipulating the environment we're just living in the environment so instinct can be likened to a qualitative multiplicity that of being in duration the realm of intuition and intelligence is more akin to quantitative multiplicity the ability to abstract categorize analyze things like that. These are different modes in which creatures act in and know the external world. This ability to respond and interact allows for novelty and differentiation to occur. This, the fact that we have to participate. See how in mechanism there's no participation happening, it's just complex things that sort of exist independent of each other and work sort of like robots. But in a more process philosophy, things are dependent on each other, they respond to each other, they interact, they participate. And this participation allows for new relationships, new ways of reconfiguring and reorganizing themselves in order to adapt and things like that. So the third step is creativity as a result of the tendency theory. So tendency is an inclination toward a particular characteristic or type of behavior. This means that all creatures' tendencies originate in this vital impulse. Even though humans are primarily in involved in the intelligence tendency, they still have access to the tendency of instinct. Because again, tendencies, they're just inclinations. We as humans just have more of an inclination to use our human intelligence rather than instinct or intuition, things like that. 
but that doesn't mean that we don't have access to this. So the vital impulse is duration itself. It's, it's this movement propelling us forward. It's space and time moving forward. And intelligence and instinct are both rooted in duration. And this means that they cannot be abstracted from duration. There's a little bit of instinct that coincides in each intelligent being. And this bit of instinct serves as the ground for intuition. It serves as this sort of, we have access to it. We sort of just have to tap into it. We have to enter into duration. So the fourth step, the final step, is intuition itself. It's the way to seize life itself and enter into duration. So why must we enter into duration? Like, what is the point of entering into duration? So Bergson believes that there is a route to absolute knowledge. And this route is not through our habitual way of knowing things based on our needs. It is through intuition. The habitual way of knowing things assumes that the obstacle to knowledge is disorder. So we always have to be categorizing, always putting things into order. Um, this question, the why is there order rather than this order, that's a common question that arises when we notice the human mind's ability to create order mysteriously out of disorder or chaos. But Bergson says that there is a more interesting and important question. Order is certainly contingent, but in relation to what? Again, another question is, why do we want to absolutely know things? I guess we want to feel in harmony. Humans struggle with this. Like animals, they're, you know, obviously they have suffering, they feel pain or, you know, they struggle in life, but they don't have this sort of existential crisis, this why question that we always have. Um, Bergson says that this isn't the way that's gonna make us attain that harmony. And it's not really a peace of mind, it's just a like, connectedness to everything animals are sort of they're more able to tap into that and feel more connected to things and to let things flow we sort of let things stick and we get caught up in all these rationalizations and things like that but i guess the point of why we want to have absolute knowledge or things like that about our existence is sort of to have more of a certainty, a peace of mind, a flow state. So Bergson sort of proposes it's this intuitive leap. It's entering into duration, noticing that there is, there's always been order. It's not about order versus disorder. It's that the way, the mode, the tendency that we're accustomed to sort of blocks our um, way of um, entering into duration, entering into this flow state. So yeah, order in relation to what? It is not a matter of order versus disorder, but rather of one order in relation to another. The, our existence, this duration, is built up of different organizations, different orders that are all in relation to each other. So it's not about something coming out of chaos or we're trying to build order out of chaos it's just that we're trying to understand order from only one lens but there's so many different kinds of order and the way to understand or achieve that absolute knowledge of all the different types of order of just existence itself is to enter into duration and not be trying to look at it from one lens which is that like habitual um human intelligence analytical sort of lens. We're trying to look at it from just a um, intuitive lens. This concept of order as one order in relation to another, it's similar to the concept of chance as opposed to necessity. Qualitative multiplicity, the kind of organization that everything in duration consists of, the fact that it's qualitative means that we can't quantify it, we can't label it, we can't know it in our normal way of knowing things. It's a qualitative, it's, a, it's an experience. It requires us to leap into that sort of intuitive mode. And since our intelligence is structured around needs and interests, it fails to notice this qualitative reality that it is enmeshed in. Order is in relation to all other types of order. Life is organization that is continuously and creatively evolving. So again, we're looking at life as something that is organization, is order. 
and there are different lenses of order. There's different, different ways of ordering things, and there are different types of order. But duration itself, life itself, is organization. It's order. It's complexity built up of processes that are interacting, participating with each other in relation to each other. And these relations are, are what make up this creative evolution that is always in duration. It's always moving towards something. That, I don't know. But it's just always... <laughs> complexifying. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little Henry Bergson series. Um, Thank you for listening and stay tuned.